We have now released issue three of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is manifestation. My guest is Paul Selig, a former college instructor. In 1987, he had a spiritual experience that left him with a gift for clairvoyance. He currently serves on the faculty of the Esalen Institute in California. His channeled books include I am the Word, the Book of Love, the Book of Knowing, the Book of Mastery, the Book of Truth, the Book of Freedom, Realization, Alchemy, the Kingdom, and Resurrection, which is considered the first book in the Manifestation Trilogy, and most recently, the Book of Innocence the second book in the Manifestation Trilogy. Paul lives on Maui in the state of Hawaii, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. You've been a, a leading voice or a leading scribe in in the field of channeling now for uh, quite a long time. You've got a long list of books. I thought today we would talk about the the topic of manifestation, but my uh, sense is that all of your books are based on a simple premise, which is that we are all sparks of the divine, or uh, we are all in, embedded in the divine, our deep self is, is is divine reality. Yeah, that's the premise. And I'm under the impression that each of your books is a less of a, a philosophical exercise and and more of a process to to lead mm -hmm. people to this this understanding because uh it's so evident on the one hand and so elusive on the other that's correct your newest book uh is focused on the concept of innocence and to the best of my understanding uh, the the theme of that book, and, and I have to confess, I didn't go through it page by page. It's actually a very dense book in, in, in its own way, but my sense of it is that the, the innocence refers to our original state, which is uh, an awareness of our divine nature. That's correct as well. Well, good. I guess the uh, interview can be finished at this point. I'm happy to expand or expound on any of these ideas, um, if you like. Um, but yeah, you summarized well, I think, what the guides have been speaking to. The very first book that they dictated through me was called I Am the Word. And that was dictated in 2009 and published in 2010. And all of the books are the unedited um, transcripts of the channeling sessions. And they just completed dictation on their 12th book a few days ago. And the 11th book, which is the Book of Innocence, is out this week. And in the very first book, they defined the word um, as the energy of the creator in action. More recently, they've begun to refer to it as the one-note song, or the one-note song that is in manifestation as all things. All things are of one source, and they're operating at different levels of vibration and articulation or manifestation and the idea of innocence and it surprised me when they went there is indeed speaking to that aspect of ourselves the divine spark or the true self um 
that operates in union with source and consequently is sort of uncorrupted, untainted, un, un, untarnished by this idea of separation and fear, which they often use interchangeably, um, because it's not, it doesn't operate at that level. They say that the monad or the divine self or the divine spark, sometimes they call it the Christ within, knows itself in union already. And the process that they've been engaging their readers in and their students is to realize the rest of us there so that we can be lifted to a level of rearticulation as what they call the true self. And that it's the true self that's doing the work. It is not the personality self trying to get spiritual. So that's been the passage, I think. Um, and now, in the book that they just completed last week, they began talking very much about how a world is altered through that manifestation and how we at a level of consciousness contribute to the reclamation of the world in its true state, which is in awareness and alignment of its source. And, you know, it's not a religious teaching. I was raised an atheist. You know, I'm flummoxed by some of this stuff. But they've been pretty clear and you know, you at the beginning, when you talked about the density of the material, it's, you know, these books are spoken into being there. There's no writing involved. I'm sitting in a chair with my eyes closed. The last seven or so books, maybe eight, were done fully in front of live audiences, you know, and, um, and then the transcripts, the videotapes um, are sent to the transcriptionist and then the transcriptionist puts them in form and then somebody proofs them again against the original recordings and those things become the books so they're spoken texts but the guides say the texts are operating at two different levels there are the words on the page which provide an intellectual context for what the reader is undergoing and they say each book in some ways is a passage through to another level of vibration and tone um, but that the real book is the vibration or the tone that informs the text. So the real book is the transmission energetically. Um, and so people are being worked with and worked with the guides and through their teachings as they partake in it. One of the things that really intrigued me in reading through uh, the book is that from time to time, you interrupt the guides. You 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 let your own personality, ask them questions or even challenge some of the things that they've said. Yeah, that's been the case. In the very first book, I was doing that, but they, we didn't know at that point to let the reader in on the fact that I was interrupting. Now they're very good. They say, Paul has a question. Paul is interrupting. And that's useful as opposed to them just responding to something that I have thought in the midst of a in the midst of the dictation. So my feeling about this is kind of simple. You know, I am not the author of these texts. I guess I'm a collaborator because it's coming through my mouth, and I don't know that they would be there in this form if I wasn't present for the dictation. But I don't consider myself the author. You know, my name's in the cover, but I didn't write it. And I don't want to be party to something that I am too confused by or I find too challenging. So okay, now they've actually gotten to this wonderful place a couple of books ago where they begin to preempt my questions. And at times they would say, Paul is interrupting or Paul has a question. I'm going, I didn't know that I was just about to have a question, but I hadn't formed it yet. And then they will form the question as they wish to answer it, which allows the dictation to become, to remain fluid. There was one book where I actually derailed the uh, the dictation with you know with my insistence and that which was that was in the book of knowing and worth I think and that chapter remains exactly as it came through with the interruptions and with the guide saying we'll tell you later if this is in the text and then they began to address my need for control over things and my fear and and then they said and this is in the book and I was oh great but you know that's the way it rolls. One of the fascinating things, maybe the most fascinating thing, is that there is a sense now you're up to nine or ten books at this point, and 
uh, it seems as if the, it was all part of a plan. There's a sequence. Yeah, there is a sequence. You're right. They just finished the 12th book, the dictation of the 12th book, and they said this is the book that completes the teaching that began with I Am the Word. And they said that each book is at a different level of resonance and tone, and he, the reader is acclimating to each through this process of engagement. I don't know if that means people have to read all the texts. I don't know that I could do that. But they've also said that they teach in a one-room schoolhouse and that they're meeting the students as they arrive. So a lot of people are discovering the teachings in the book Resurrection, and some more will discover it in the book of Innocence, and they will be met. I find it interesting because I do live events, you know, and the guides dictated um, the newest book that will be out in a year um, and Book of Innocence in front of students. And they're not going back and sort of explaining everything anymore. They're just diving right into where they're at. And the amazing thing to me is, is everybody's getting it. You know, the people who are there for the first time are getting it and they're getting the energy. They're feeling the energetic attunements. The guides work with attunements, and they're palpable. People can feel them. So that makes me feel good. But they also said, and they just said this for real a few days ago, that, you know, there are more books, but it's a different teaching. They're moving out of what they've been doing into teachings on union, which is really, I think, true union, which is what they really want to be going towards. And I think everything else has probably been in preparation for this but they've gone from the very first book which was i think about the singular the first trilogy really was about the singular pursuit and the the, the awareness and then they moved gradually through up into the collective the book that they just finished is for the collective it's not about individual mastery it's about how the individual manages to maintain a level of uh, of co-resonance with what the guides call the upper room which they say is the level of consciousness that they're teaching us to align to who are these guides uh, to you, and why are they plural instead of uh, guide? I just know how I get them. You know, I the only reason they're called the guides is that my ex from 20-something years ago, when he found out I could do this, used to say, ask the guides this, ask the guides that. So they got to, they got to be called the guides. It was really simple. I don't, that's not a name they've given themselves. But it's a, it's a title that they seem to accept. I don't get any complaints. I don't think they could care less. When asked to give a name, the name that's come through has been the name Melchizedek, and it's a priesthood. And, um, you know, it's uh, their teachers. That's all I know. They're teachers, and they come to teach. And they say, this is an old teaching come in a form that we can experience now. And that they've been doing this for a very, very, very long time. I mean, that's what I know. I tend to get a little cautious around names because people can attach things to them. And there can be a fair amount of sort of spiritual materialism that gets attached to things. So, you know, I care about the quality and the, the, the truth of the teaching. And it's hard to mistake the truth of the teaching. You know, I was just saying this to somebody earlier today. The woman who was the channel for A Course in Miracles, which is not a book that I've worked with. Um, I tried once years ago, but I didn't go there. Um, but I heard her say about her experience and about the book. She said, I don't believe it, but I know it's true. And I thought, that's right. That makes so much sense to me. I get that entirely. Um, so they call themselves other things. You know, the, my favorite way that they've described themselves is by saying, we are who you become when you know who you are. And at other times, they've called themselves the true self in a plural way. But true self is a term or a title that they use interchangeably with Christ. And they're not talking about Jesus per se, their, their definition of Christ has always been the aspect of the creator that can be realized in form. And they usually use the word monad, you know, to describe that. So, you know, 
all I know is, this is all I know today. I don't think I'm capable as Paul of sitting in a chair and closing my eyes and dictating now 12 books that don't require any editing. It's nuts to me. You know, and, and the days I go, what is this? And this is also crazy. I go, well, 12 books, they don't require any editing and they're spoken into being. There is no writing involved. I'm kind of fascinated by that and the phenomena of this. I just read before I came on with you um, a lecture that was delivered, I guess, this week, last week, because it just came in for me to, to approve. And I don't really read them. I never actually read them, but I decided to read this one because I recall it being an interesting lecture, and it was after the book was done, and they were still lecturing with the kind of efficiency that they have when they're delivering a book. It's When they do a book, you're sitting there feeling like somebody has prepared this thing, and they're just talking it to you, and all you have to do is keep up. And this had that tone. Other channelings feel a little bit more, uh, not diffuse, but when they're repeating things that they've spoken of before and they're they're doing that usually for the benefit of the new students i'm like okay there they go again and i'm just like in the background with this one i was going wow 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 but i think i don't know if this was the one i i, I start you know i often whisper and repeat when i channel that's how i've been doing it but this week i did it and they were channeling direct and that's been happening more and more and the challenge when i channel direct is i don't remember anything pretty much and that's challenging for me because I don't get to interject. I don't get to question and interrupt. But that's, I think, when they talked about where they were going in the future, that there were more books and that they had every intention of bringing them through. They actually said there are three more and they're already written. I'm going, oh, God. But, you know, this is what I've been doing every year, pretty much. I mean, there have been 12 books in, I think, 14 years. You know, it's fast. As I recall from your bio, uh, the process began with a, uh, a mystical spiritual experience back in 1987. That would be 35 years ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I was told that it sounded like what I experienced at 25 was a spontaneous kundalini awakening and then i thought well maybe i was just breathing funny and maybe you know i didn't know about breath work and all those things i mean but i was using a kundalini mantra i was trying to teach myself to meditate and i there was this thing happening called the harmonic convergence in 87 and i was told people were going to be waking up and i thought i think quite logically well, if there is a God or such a thing as God and you asked to be woken up, why would it want to say no? So I went up to the roof of my building with this very oddly expectant sense that something was going to happen and something did. And it was a very physical experience for me. And it's funny. And lately I've been like, well, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was nothing. And I met somebody the other day and I described what happened and basically how my life fell apart <laughs> afterwards. And he said, well, that was a Kundalini awakening. And it was, what did he say it was? It was an unintegrated Kundalini. I said, well, that makes sense to me. I don't know what it was. But all I know was I started seeing little lights around people. And for somebody like me who'd been raised pretty much an atheist, and I had heard a voice a few months before that experience basically telling me to get my act together, stop drinking and drugging and doing the things that I was doing. And that came in response to prayer. And I'd never prayed before for real until that time. So all of these pieces lined up and, you know, worked together, I think, to lead me in a very different direction than I had intended. I am not living the life that I expected to be living in any way, shape, or form at all. I don't know that I would recognize myself, truthfully. Um, and, and I'm sure there are people from those days that are going, oh, poor Paul, what happened to him, you know? And I'm quite content with how this has happened now. But I have to say, my process of spiritualization, I'm not going to call it awakening because I don't feel enlightened or all that awakened. But my process was hard and messy and not in the least bit 
at least from my perspective, elegant. When I look at it now from the age I am at, looking back 35 years, I go, wow, that really was kind of remarkable and elegant and how I survived that and how I learned through that and what a gift that was. But, you know, for me, and I've never been a very good new ager, it really wasn't crystals and rainbows at all. It was, what the is going on here? You know, and especially, well, when I began to open up with ability, when the clear audience began to kick in, and the clear sentience began to kick in, and that was really after I studied a form of energy healing. Somebody, when I was struggling, gave me free sessions or next to free sessions for about two years. It was very kind of him. He was very generous with me um, because I was opening up and I didn't know what to make of any of it. But once I began to open up and was working with this stuff, I was getting at least verification experientially that there was something more, that this doesn't, wasn't some, you know, unicorn-informed fantasy of spirituality. I mean, when you can feel the tumor in somebody else's breast, in your own breast tissue, and you can hear the name of the apartment building that they grew up in, you know, when you're working with them, and that's where all the crap happened, you know that there's more going on. You know, and the psychic stuff that I do and still do, which I consider to be different than the channeling, was helpful, especially at that time, because it validated enough, just enough, that maybe I wasn't completely on the wrong path and throwing my life away. But a lot of people thought that I think I was. I mean, I'd had a master's from Yale. I'd been a writer, and I couldn't write. When I stopped drinking, I actually had the worst writer's block of anybody I've ever met. Lasted for years and was a source of shame. The irony now is that the books are dictated over a matter of days. The last book took 22, 22 days of sessions over five weeks. The first book took two weeks, maybe two and a half. Sometimes they take 32, and that's if I stretch the sessions over and take time off to recover, which I didn't do this last time. And they told me not to, and they told me I wouldn't, and I didn't. It happened just as they said. So, you know, that's what it is. Um, but that's what happened in 87. And um, I think continues to happen. And the work has always been experiential for me. And when people work with the text, they're having comparable experiences. I mean, the books support people in their own experience of energy and vibration. And I, in the workshops, you know, if you can do it there, or you come to a workshop, you do it with a partner. You can all feel it. And I love that because I really have no interest whatsoever in people deferring to me. I don't want people to give me their authority. I, could, I really don't want it. It's a headache. It's projection. You know, I'm just a guy who shows up and does the work as, as a radio, which is what I think of myself as. But when people begin to have their own experience of this stuff, they can be in their own integrity with it. They can give themselves what they need, which is their own knowing, their true knowing. And I think being in one's true knowing is far more effective and wonderful than this desire that many of us have to throw our authority at the feet of somebody else and then get angry when it doesn't go the way they want or get frightened when they think that they're not going to get what they want. All that crap that goes along with projection and attachment. True knowing is a, a wonderful phrase, and I think that it's intimate, re, intimately related to uh, the topic of uh, today's conversation, a manifestation. What is more important to manifest than true knowledge of yourself? Yeah. Well, the funny thing is the guides say the true self knows and the small self thinks. They let us understand what the difference is. And they say, you know, whenever you have known something, and all you have to do is go back in your life to a time when you really knew something. I knew I was in love. I knew I lost the job. I knew it wasn't going to work out. Whatever it wants, whatever you want to think. You'll, rem you'll notice that at that moment of knowing, there was no question attached. In knowing, there is not a question. This is that simple. And also, this is really interesting. They've said in, in true knowing, there is no fear. So even if you get the difficult di medical diagnosis, you know, like, that's not what's frightening. What's frightening is what's going to happen next. 
How's the treatment going to be? All that stuff that is all about future projection. The guides say true knowing is the divine self knowing through us. You know, I think we can get nudged from guides and we can have moments of inspiration. But true knowing, which is where they seem to be leading us towards as a state of being, I don't think it means that we're not thinking, but I do think that we are navigating a little bit differently with knowing as opposed to just operating through inherited information. This is what a good vacation looks like. That's what a bad vacation looks like. This is what you should aspire to. That's what nobody should aspire to. And that's just all a bunch of stuff that we make important through the collective. I read a fascinating article in an obscure paper, and it compared your work to the work of another channeler, Esther Hicks, and, and the whole law of attraction. And, and they were saying people flocked to this idea of the law of attraction because they thought it would make them rich, it would give them power or love. And, and it said, uh, the writer was very frustrated. He said people expected all of these things, and then when it didn't happen, uh, they got frustrated, and Esther Hicks began withdrawing from public uh, appearances and, and also began suggesting that it was the fault of the people themselves if they weren't um, realizing their desires. And then he said, well, Paul Selig is completely different. He doesn't promise that you're going to get anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know the article, and to be honest with you, I don't know the Hicks's work. Um, and this is because I don't read other channels. I read half a Seth book when I was a graduate student 40 years ago, and I read somebody else. I read some of the Semea Roman stuff in, my, in the 1980s, which I, was useful and I thought was lovely. But there's very, I, I know very little. There may be other people that I've seen bits of. Now, I, I don't think that there's, I've manifested things, you know, I'm living in a, a place that I never would have dreamed I would live in and a house that I just love. And when I look back on it, when I used to play The Sims, which was after a breakup or something, you know, 30 years ago, whenever it was, 25 years ago, I, um, or whenever it came out, I designed this house again and again and again. It's the house I'm now living in. It's amazing. Somebody else built it. But it's the house that I used to imagine myself in. So who knows? I think there's there's a lot to it. But the guides have said again and again, there is nothing wrong with the house on the hill. Somebody gets to live there. But why do you want it? And if you want it because you think you're supposed to have it or to be the envy of your neighbors or to whatever, then you're creating in fear. And the action of fear is to claim more fear. So the guides have said, and this is not about the Hicks because I'm not going to, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't have any opinion on other channeled work. I really can't. And that's not how I like to position myself anyway. What the guides have said is that we're always creating. Always, always, always. Everything, you see, people think that manifestation is about getting something. But everything you see in your life right now, you are in vibrational accord with. And they say A-C-C-O-R-D or A-C-H-O-R-D is on a piano. And they do talk about lifting to a level of vibration or tone. They call it, they call it the upper room. And that when you are claiming at that level, you're actually moving to a level of reception. And the difference is, is that you're not deciding what should be based in what they call the common field or what you're taught to want. So most of us are taught what we should aspire to, to give us a sense of value or worth. If I have the better house, the better car, the better relationship, if my children are doing what I think they should, then I am okay. And that's all a bunch of stuff. The guides have said that the personality self knows itself through history. That's all it knows. You can call it the ego, I guess, but they say the personality knows itself through data, historical data. The divine self or the monad is not bound by that and then can be moved to a level of receptivity to claim what is already yours. 
And the key then is, I think, the knowing of God, if you want to call it that, or the universe, you're going to call that as source. And also, this odd presumption that maybe source knows already what our real needs are, and that real needs will be met. And then we go into an alignment with that, and then things start to fall into place. I had a funny experience when they first started teaching this, and I'm going, what the hell is this stuff? And people can get mad, and it's people. everybody wants to get what they want, and I still don't have a partner, and I complain about that, and why don't I? Why am I? You know, I have all my, my agenda of complaints. But I, they were teaching this stuff about moving to receptivity, and it will just come. And I remember one day thinking, oh, God, I've got to go to a dermatologist and have this thing looked at. And then the next day, out of the blue, a dermatologist's office called me and said, um, we have you in our files from about two years ago, and we're just following. And I'm like, what? And I had an appointment in two days or something, and it was great. But, like, I was sort of met. And that doesn't mean you don't have to pick up the phone and sh or show up for your appointment. You know, people expect, you know, the guys have said this years ago, you know, we bring you gifts and we ring the doorbell when you don't open the damn door to get it, you know, and, and we have to do our part too. So I don't, um, I, I actually think that this idea of creating and it is true. We're always doing it. We're always, the guys go so far as to say, we're always getting what we expect, which really stinks. Because that's the frame of reality that we're holding in. And also they talk about the individual act of manifestation, but the collective act that we're engaged in as well, because we're not living in our individual bubbles, you know. So if I live in a town where they're dumping chemicals into the water supply and people are getting sick, did I create that personally? No, but I am in alignment to a world where companies can dump their chemicals into the water system. And that's part of a collective agreement until we realize that we're actually in coherence, which is, again, vibrational accord with a manifest world. Um, I think we're going to have a hard time. We're going to be playing victim or blaming. And I don't think either of those things is going to bring about the kind of change that is going to be sustainable. I know, for example, that as I'm speaking to you at this moment, you're in a rainforest on the island of Maui, and Maui just suffered a, a, a terrible disaster, maybe the worst in, in their history. Yeah, they did. We did. I live on the North Shore. This wasn't the part of the island that was affected by the fires. The whole island, of course, has been affected, and it's tragic. And um, you know, I think that there are practical reasons. The winds were insane. The power lines were coming down. There were pastures that were dry. You know, there wasn't enough water in the hydrants. There wasn't enough access out of the town. I mean, it was a horrifying thing. And um, what I'm not going to do is go into spiritual metaphor around this thing. I think that would be disrespectful. But I do think that we live in a world where we don't care enough for our neighbor's well-being. And I've, Maui's been remarkable in terms of how I think people have really come forward in support of, of, of that town. Um, but I think on a larger level, and the guides have said this, we're not good caretakers. We have not been good caretakers of of this world, or what they call what we what we say is our world. This reality they call this reality that we call a world. And you know, when we're responsible for it, and this is going to continue to happen until we become responsible for it, and that means we have to change our relationship to it and to our participation in what we see. So. You know, I lived in New York City um, downtown during 9-11, and the guides actually said that, that I heard about it before it happened. I didn't believe it because I don't do world predictions. Um, but my ex at the time wanted to know if the rent was going to be paid on, on his business um, in the month of October, I think it was. 
And the answer was no. And said, why, why not? I said, well, there's going to be a terrorist attack in lower Manhattan. And indeed there was, and the rent wasn't made because the whole it was shut down. Everything was gone. And I lived through the AIDS epidemic in New York, which was horrific and unimaginable at the time. I was a young man and most of my friends were dying all around me. And you go to the wise, and then I have to go, you know, my father was, you know, a Holocaust survivor. You know, it's like, you know, it goes back and back and back. And we've always had these things. You know, we've always had these things. And I think until we start lifting our consciousness to a level where certain things are not possible anymore, we're going to have the problems we're not. The guides have said, you've lived in a world for so long where there's always been war that you expect it to be there, and consequently you will always have it. And the only way that stops is by lifting to a level of consciousness or vibrational accord where it's not a possibility. You know, the guides say the only problem humanity really faces is what they call the denial of the divine. That's the problem we have. And they say everything is holy. You can't make anything holy. It already is. But you can deny the divine in anything. And they say very simply, who you put in darkness, what you put in darkness calls you to that darkness. Again, it's vibrational accord. And, you know, if we can put a whole country in darkness or this group of people or that human being or those, whatever, you know, that thing we actually accelerate. And unless we begin to see things that happen as an opportunity to choose differently and to value others differently and to care for others because they have the right to be cared for, I think we're going to have a hard time. There was a moment in uh, your book on innocence where I got the feeling you were almost like the biblical Abraham arguing with God in, in, in which... They were saying, you know, denial of the divine when, when you act out of fear and anger, that's, that's not of God. And I think you were saying something, well, if everything is of God, isn't the denial of the divine also of God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably did. I don't remember what they answered. Um, I really don't. I should, I mean, you know, maybe one day I'll find the passage. It's, it sounds interesting to me. But, you know, early, well, a few years ago, maybe eight years ago now, I was doing an event at a bookstore. And somebody asked, raised their hand and said, well, what do your God say about fear? Is fear of God, too, if everything's of God? And they said, yes, it is, but it denies it. Fear denies God, and it seeks to replicate itself at its level. They also said, which I thought was interesting, is fear is not wise. Fear does not transcend because fear is actually operating in, a, in, a, in one tone. It's another, it's another broadcast. And it doesn't become wise. And you can transform fear by attending to it from the higher, not from the lower. You really can't shake hands with it and dance with it because probably it's going to win. That's what I understand, at least. And that means we're not spiritually bypassing our fear. It doesn't mean we have to honor that we experience it and it's there. But we don't have to do is feed at lunch every day. You know, that's the difference. You uh, use the phrase, or the guides use the phrase, the upper room as, as a metaphor for... Uh, uh, some higher level of consciousness. I, I, there are probably similar phrases in Sanskrit and in other spiritual traditions. Uh, can, can you elaborate on the upper room a little? Well, the upper room, they say that we are experiencing life in an octave of vibration. And they say an octave has low notes and high notes, but it's an octave. And this is the reality that we know. They call it often the common field that we know ourselves in. The upper room, they say, is the octave of vibration that is concurrent with the one that we know, but is the octave above. And I think above isn't better. It's just higher vibration, higher tone. We are the ones who decide what's better or worse. That's our logic and systemic thinking so they say that the god within or the monad or the christ or whatever you want to call it the true self already expresses at that level of vibration but we have been encumbered and it has been encumbered through our 
alignment to the density of the field we've known. So it's been weighted and it's not been as able to, I mean, this is me probably saying it all wrong and they're nodding. Yes, I'm saying it all wrong. So what we use to block our expression is what hinders it. We have free will and we do get to choose. And if I want to choose to hurt myself or somebody else, I choose it. I incur the karma that it brings and I reaffirm my sense of separation. The idea of lifting to the upper room, they say, is actually done by the true self. The true self is what lifts with our agreement and lifts us with it. Um, so they say it this way, and I, th I thought this was a simple way to understand it. So we're, mu we're all as if pieces of music. You know, our world is music. And what they're doing in the teachings is transposing the music to be played in a higher octave. That's it. Any, they say any song can be sung in a higher octave into eternity beyond what your ears can imagine. So they're lifting us to the next level. In the upper room, they say, is really, I think it's probably the beginning of, of what we can experience. I think that there's, they talk about the kingdom, which is the awareness of the inherent divine and all manifestation is what you come to through the king, through, through the upper room. That's where you may know yourself. Um, but what else did they say about this, the upper room? There was something I was going to say, and I just forgot it. Well, you, you said something to the effect that they are lifting us up. And no, the, 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 spark, the divine spark is doing it. The guides are giving us, the guides work with attunements, and they're spoken attunements. They say the language is encoded with vibration. And the attunements are sort of the activation of that part of ourselves in a reclaimed state. But some of the attunements, they say, are really invoked at the level of monad. So when the guides say the claim, um, for us to say, I know who I am in truth, I know what I am in truth, I know how I serve in truth, which is an attunement. This isn't Paul, who's such and such years old and lives in such and such, whatever, you know, the, my, my descriptors. It's not Paul announcing, hi, I'm Paul, and I know who I am. Because I'm not always going to be this age or in this body or look like I do today or maybe live where I do. You know, those are ways of knowing myself, but they're not who I am. So the claim I know who I am is the divine self announcing its own expression. I know what I am is the form it has taken as you, as me, as whatever form articulation has brought us to. I know how I serve. The guides say, is not what you do for a living. It's not about getting a job in the spiritual market. You know, it's, it's how one serves, they say, is how one is most fully expressed as the true self. That's it. That's it. That really is it. And then you're, you're off and running. And it's that part of us that gets lifted to the upper room. The claim that follows the ones that they just I just described, the next claim is, I am free, I am free, I am free. And that is, again, spoken by the monad. It's not Paul saying, oh, I'm free of what my neighbors think of me, or I'm free from the need to mow my lawn. I mean, maybe those things are true. But I think they're saying I, the claim is the I am presence or the divine self is free of the attachments that were incurred at the level of personality through the common field. And that's what allows us to go to the upper room. And then the claim from that is I am in the upper room which is the monad announcing its arrival, and then the claim, I have come, I have come, I have come, which is quite potent, and it's the monad announcing its arrival and agreement to be made in form, to be realized through the individual at the level of consciousness. It's quite something. But these things are quite physical, and when they're invoked, you can feel them usually energetically, and it's, they're very interesting. I used to use, think of these as like, songs in a jukebox like you plug in a4 and always you know the same song is going to play it's a4 you can always get it through that these aren't um things that this isn't like magic wand abracadabra stuff really i think it's it's potent in a different way but when people work with it there's usually great affect and change that occurs and that seems to be where they're supporting us in this alignment to the upper room
Well, I like that phrase, they're supporting us. And, and I also recall one of your videos or lectures, uh, I'm not sure which, suggested that uh, humanity as a whole is going through a uh, oh, yeah. movement to a higher octave. Yep, that's what they say. They said, like, it's in the newest book, they said the exodus has begun, and it's the exodus from the old way of being. But they've also said, and again, this is why I'm never going to be very popular, I think. They said it's going to take four generations to begin to be seen. And that's okay. People want it now. You know, where's my, where's my cruise line to, to the upper room and to the kingdom? And I paid my price. I bought the book. Where is it now? I want it now. You can have the experiences that they speak to, I think, now. But what they're talking about is a real change in our idea collectively of who we are and that the process that we're in now, which is the challenging part, is the process of releasing the old or the foundations of the old are being seen as faulty and are beginning to crumble. And I don't get that this is going to get any bit easier in the coming times. Um, but I also understand that how we address this will make the passage more hopeful and more agreeable. Just last week or two weeks, this is in the book, they said, you know, it's like there's a ship at the dock and everybody's on a damn ship and we're trying to get off it and you can't really. And the ship is leaving the dock and once everybody's on the boat, everybody's saying, screaming for the the captain to make us go this way or that way and there's a mutiny on board and people are fighting and throwing up over the side of the ship and the ship is going over rough waters you know but the thing is they say you're going to a shore that you have not known yet and some of this passage i suspect is releasing the attachment to what we knew so that the new can be seen and experienced and they also say and i found this very helpful that those that are, that are being born are far more ready for this than some of us are because they're not attached already to systems of what should be and how things should be just because it's been. You know, in my generation, you were supposed to go to college. That's what somebody was supposed to do that if you're going to have a career. That's who you, you had to do that. And now people are going and, and, and you know, and be in debt for the next 30 years, I didn't pay off my student loans till I was 50. Yeah, it was awful. I didn't take a vacation, I think, till those things were paid. It was, and I was a college teacher, so I wasn't raking in the box. Um, but I think people are questioning things that we just took for granted would always be there. And I think the questioning is part of this process. And some of it stinks and is, is frustrating and is ugly and some of it's of great worth and great merit and granted. I mean, this is the example. This is this will help because I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth if I continue. They say it's as if we're all on a dance floor and we're all dancing and the music has been changed, but we don't know it yet. We still think we're still dancing to the old song. And because the beat is different, it's a it's it's, it's a more rapid music we don't yet know how to move within it so it's awkward and we're stumbling and we're bumping into things and that that's going to continue for a while until we have a sense of where we stand and what we're really encountering to me four generations isn't bad no i thought that was great too you should have heard the groan that went up in the live stream when they said that four generations there's supposed to be a great awakening tomorrow i had friends I mean, that's funny. You stick around, you know. I remember, it was it 2012? That was the... And I had a workshop scheduled in the Bay Area in 2012. And I was very new to doing workshops. I mean, the first book didn't come out till 2010. And people were saying, why are you going to do a workshop in 2012? The world is going to... And I'm thinking, no, it's not. I had people calling me right and left. And I don't know who the other 
psychic or channel was who was telling them that all of their homes in Malibu were going to fall into the ocean and should they and they were asking me should they sell and I'm going I don't think so I don't get listen I'm not going to make some I don't comment on other channelers works I just don't get that I don't get that but I showed up and did my workshop and was there a change in consciousness at that time very possibly yes I had a change of consciousness in, in, at the time of the harmonic convergence I really did an abrupt and challenging one, but there were other things going on that I can blame that on too. I was newly sober, I was poor as a church mouse, and my whole sense of identity was collapsing around me, which is really what happened to me from 25 to whenever. You know, who I thought I was was starting to fall away, and that's a scary thing when you undergo that. And it's also scary when you're, you know, Perilous. It's hard to focus on your spiritual life when you don't know if you're going to eat. But I ate, and I made it through, and grateful, grateful for all of it now. You had this awakening in 1987, and it really wasn't until 2010 that your first book was, was published. So it seems as if it took a couple of decades for you to really integrate what had happened. No. Nope, nope, nope. That's not what happened at all. Um, 87, I started opening up psychically. Maybe by 30, I was studying energy healing. And 31, I think it was when it was probably some 31, 32 in that period of time, I started doing a little group in my apartment, which is when I began channeling. Because I was doing energy work, I was volunteering at a center for people that were living with life-challenging illness at the time. It was the AIDS epidemic, and these places were starting up. And I was hearing things for the clients, which surprised me, because I didn't know I could do that. And they were verifying the information. I was feeling what was going on in their bodies and my own, and it was like, what, what is this? So I asked my teacher at that time, she's no longer living, if I could do a little group, and she said yes. And I thought I would just be doing the work that she was teaching us. Um, and the very first session, I started to hear things. And it took me until age 48 for them to start lecturing through me. And part of the reason for that was maybe I wasn't ready. And there were a couple of psychics that said to me around that time that my real work would kick in between like 48 and 50, which is what happened with the books um, I was being prepared for throughout that. I had a group that met in my apartment for about 18 years, sometimes three people, sometimes 10 people. They put 10 bucks in a basket. I get a pizza at the end of the night. That was what I did. And I was putting my, you know, I was piecing my life together in an academic life, which is how I was making my living. Um, I quit smoking at 48 because the guide said, we want to continue working with you and through you, but we can't unless you address this. And I rarely hear things like that, but it shook me up. And I knew I was smoking four packs a day. I would have been dead. I was hugely overweight. So I quit the next day, and that's when the lecture started. And the moment I became willing to transcribe the lectures... Um, record and transcribe. And I only did that because another medium found out that I wasn't doing that and was angry and frustrated. And so I started to do it. And then I had had terrible writer's block. And the first lecture was about five, seven pages long, required no editing. And it was beautiful. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. No editing. And it came out of me. And so every week I would show up again for my group and look forward to transcribing the lecture to see if it happened again. And every week it was a perfectly spoken teaching. It didn't require editing. And then they brought through the books. Once I was willing to do that, they, they haven't stopped since. So I was being prepared for all of that. And I honestly think that if I had been doing this in my 30s, it probably would have been a train wreck. You know, it would have been about the ego in another way. And you have to, some, sometimes you have to, you're, you're, sometimes you have to learn to let go a bit about what other people think of you to show up fully. And I had a, a, somebody, I had a reading once with somebody who said something really interesting. This was the same psychic who predicted the first book, and I thought she was out of her mind, totally out of her mind. Oh, you're going to write a book? It's all about the Christ. I'm like, what? This woman is nuts. But she also said to me, you've been through enough humiliation in your life that you're prepared for this. 
which basically meant, and it's not that I recommend humiliation, it sucks. But, you know, when you're the chubby kid in school and, you know, and all those things, you get, you get used to that kind of stuff. But, I, you know, I think what happened was at the time this came, I was actually ready to devote myself to this. And I did, and I have, and I'm grateful that I have. And this is the one area of my life that I feel has been well surrendered. And it's the one part of my life that seems to work without my worrying. All I have to do is show up. That's my job. Other areas of my life maybe could use some surrender because I still have an investment in outcome. Let me ask you one final question, Paul. Uh, my background is in parapsychology. And uh, since you've had all of these paranormal experiences, I wonder if you have uh, had a, an interest in uh, working with scientists to Absolutely, l- learn yeah. more about it. I would love to. You know, there are some neurologists in, um, or I don't know, there's another name for what they do that um i met and they wired me up um and this has only happened once and i didn't know what to think and I, they sent me the readout and i can't read out it's like 80 pages of data and scans but what she what this woman said to me which was very interesting she said you have the mind of a it's all gamma whatever that is it's like you have the mind of a meditating monk and i'm like that's not me at all i'm a warrior and i'm i don't that's not right but when i was channeling the only real difference was is that my auditory receptors lit up differently, you know. So I am interested, and I've always been interested to know what happens. I met with people years ago at the, uh, what's it called, the, the, in West Virginia. There's the Center for Perceptual Studies at UVA. And they said I was too active when I worked to be wired up to their equipment. But in those days, I was like such a physical thing. Now I could actually sit still. Those days, I actually used to have to walk when I channeled. I, there was so much energy going through me, I couldn't contain it. Now I'm, I'm a little more used to it. So yeah, I would love to do that. I think it'd be really interesting. I would imagine you could make a real contribution. I don't know. The clairsentience is interesting, and that's we didn't talk about that, but that's what I do when I work psychically. And I, I step into other people. I feel what they're feeling. I can hear them at a certain level. My eyes, when I'm shining the guides, my eyes change color, I'm told. They often go very pale blue, and I don't have that. So all of those things are really interesting to me, whether it's mirror neurons or something else. I just, I don't have a context for that. I flunked science and, and math pretty much. I was not a good student, so. You were uh, a teacher, a college instructor in the field of creative writing. Mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. But I was a stoner in high school and I didn't, I used to go sleep through biology and earth science and geometry. I don't remember it all. That was just still, I couldn't go there. So that was who I was. Well, Paul Selig, this has been a pleasure connecting with you. I really enjoy your humanity. It's so, uh, in in some ways, a, a beautiful contrast with your books, which focus so clearly on divinity to understand uh, the human being behind it all. Thank you. Thank you for being with me, Paul. It's been a, a joy and a pleasure. And I hope that we have future opportunities to connect. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.